one of your books is called The Rise and Fall of Mary England. That was the first one I read. And I've been brought up with this idea that I think it's in things like Kingsley Amos's Lucky Jim, you know, where the uh, academic professor hero uh, says things like, oh, Merry England is a sort of a fiction. It never happened. Um, it was sort of invented by perhaps the Victorians or something. Uh, and it was a load of nonsense. But what you did in, in this book was uh, go back to the sort of primary sources of the sorts you were talking about earlier, which I think in, that is, you know, you talk, you go and look at the account books, for example, of um, medieval and early modern households. You also look at wills. And this gives us an amazing insight into the way people kind of enjoyed themselves. And you say that, that there actually was a thing, there was a Merry England, it was a, it was a real fact. Yes, it, it certainly was. Uh, it's a period between circa 1400 and circa 1540, in which the British decided to ally traditional merrymaking to the Christian church. Uh, one aspect of this is financial. Until round about 1400, the way in which the parish is paid for, the church is repaired, the uh, candles and the bread and the wine, everything that's needed for services is purchased, is either by the church having its own parish resources like flocks of sheep or land and getting the profit, or else by laying rates on the people. And then around 1400, the idea came in that everybody would have a better time if the cash was raised by merrymaking. And so all sorts of pastimes, maple dancing, dances to uh, bring in summer, midsummer bonfires, hobby horse dances at midwinter, uh, carrying garlands round and singing in May. All, all these things have been condemned by a lot of churchmen hitherto as being unchristian, sinful, liable to get people boozed up and uh, maybe uh, get into bed with the wrong people. And now the church annexes them, and most of the money for the church is raised by seasonal festivity, by throwing parties, uh, which everybody joins in, with all these condemned pastimes uh, going on at them. And uh, the proceeds go to keep up the church. Um, so it's a win-win because the yeah. devil's snares have actually been turned to the church's profit. <laughs> and if it's uh, a general communal festivity in which the whole village joins in and the priest and the elders are there, people are less likely to get boozed up, get into fights and get pregnant. How did the church actually collect this money? Are you saying that you would have to go through some kind of turnstile and hand over your groat in order to join the dancing around the maypole yeah uh, or if you didn't have a groat you'd be con you'd be baking something or rolling something edible and then contributing it to the feast and with the money that people put in particularly the, the wealthier farmers you'd be able often to hire in a professional entertainer like a comedian or a professional dancer or an acrobat or some, you know, somebody to give a, a bit of extra to the festivities that people couldn't afford privately. So it's a bit like a kind of grand uh, village fate. Yes, and under impetus uh, of this kind of society, society in that period got more and more heavily evolved in ritual. So uh, municipal and parish festivities become more and more elaborate and more and more expensive and more and more lucrative. And church ceremonial and ritual becomes more and more elaborate at the same time. This is a society which really enjoys ceremony, uh, both festive and religious. So were people, would you guess that people in this period in um, 15th century England were, you know, generally quite merry, jolly? Um, you know, I was thinking about the word merry earlier. Uh, why does, why, where, where does that word come from? Why is it merry that gets applied to England and then merry that gets applied to Christmas? It's such a kind of medieval feeling word. It seems to sort of summon up these images of... Um, you know, maybe not Falstaffian merriment, but, but a, a Bruegel painting or something where people are just sort of really just drinking and dancing and having a lot of fun um, before the Reformation. <laughs> so it, it has a kind of medieval vibe. 
Uh, can you tell us a bit about that, the word itself? Because I think it, it sort of fell into, you know, it, it sounds quite archaic to us now, really, um, unless it's used, you know, next to Christmas or next to Mary England as a kind of historical idea. Yeah, we have two words of choice when we wish somebody uh, a good time or a good Christmas. And one is Mary, which is Anglo-Saxon, and the other is Happy, which is Danish. So we got one from our early English forebears and one from the Viking settlers in the North and the Midlands. And so really a lot of our, our modern English language is a choice between speaking Anglo-Saxon or speaking Danish. Mary got made the word of choice because uh, when the the whole system hit the rocks with the Reformation. In the 1550s, people looking back nostalgically towards a less divided, uh, a wealthier, a less stressed society, and a society which encouraged fun, coined the phrase Merry England. Uh, I think just one or two people did it, mm -hmm. and it caught, caught on through through print. Uh, I think it's just serendipity. If one of those two people had said Happy England instead, that's what we'd call it. But by the 1550s, it was a slogan and it got re revived by the Victorians using Tudor texts. <laughs>